Good. Uh, well, I'm pleased to be joined today uh, uh, for a little bit by uh, Dr. Robert P. Jones, uh, who is the founder and uh, chief executive officer of Public Religion Research Institute. Uh, and uh, 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 Public Religion Research Institute, uh, besides its website, has a, a daily email that goes out that I rely on uh, uh, nearly every day, nearly like devotional literature, <laughs> um, uh, to see, uh, you know, am I missing anything? What's going on in uh, uh, religion, culture, politics in the U.S.? And uh, uh, Robbie and his uh, associates do a great job of both um, uh, uh, capturing uh, what's going on and, and, and you know, giving you links to uh, the articles and, and a bit of interpretation with it, in addition to the uh, work that they're always doing around uh, new survey research and value surveys and the like. It's, it's great. And Robbie, thanks so much for being on with us, with, with me today. Oh, well, thanks for that introduction. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, good. Good. So I first got acquainted with you through uh, reading your 2016 book, The End of White Christian America, uh, where, uh, for those who don't know the book, uh, he systematically shows the demographics behind the conclusion that white Christians as a numerical majority in the United States is dead, uh, which means not without power, um, but no longer the numerical majority of the nation. Uh, and uh, for anybody who's wondering, you know, so what did he do to conclude that? Well, 40 years worth of data from the National Opinion Research Center you know, a few studies and the like, and then 150,000 phone call interviews conducted by PRRI. It's a really uh, fabulous piece of research, and it's pretty in, 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 incontrovertible, uh, uh, I think, the conclusions you draw. Um, there is a paragraph for that book that, I don't know, do you have the book in front of you? Or, no, you I, know? I don't write it okay. hand. Then I'm going to go ahead and read it. Okay, great. Because it is, because it, it is um, uh, relevant to uh, even what the election is today, mm -hmm. uh, that we're election season we're in. And you say towards the end of the book, it's clear that white evangelicals have entered a grand bargain with the self-described master deal maker with high hopes that this alliance will stem the tide and turn back the clock. And Donald Trump's installation as the 45th president of the United States may in fact temporarily prop up by pure exertions of political and legal power, power that white Christian Americans perceive they have lost. But these short-term victories will come at an exorbitant price, like the biblical story of Esau, who exchanged his inheritance for a pot of stew. White evangelicals have traded their distinctive values for fleeting political power. 20 years from now, there is little chance that 2016 will be celebrated as the revival of white Christian America no matter how many Christian right leaders are installed in positions of power over the next four years. Rather, this election will most likely be remembered as the one in which white evangelicals traded away their integrity and influence in a gambit to resurrect their past. Um, that, I, I'm reading that because first, it gives hope to people like me, <laughs> um, <clears throat> like I am, who, who am you know, deeply, uh, uh, disturbed, disappointed by uh, not only the last election, but what the last election meant in terms of the white power structure and what I consider to be the misuse of Christianity um, as I would hope Christianity would be and is in certain parts of the country. Um, so uh, uh, you followed up then uh, with a book that is um, uh, I highly recommend to everybody I'm, I'm uh, talking to these days, uh, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy uh, in American Christianity. Um, I appreciate both the um, personal stories that you tell uh, in, in there and the history and interpretation and the like, uh, uh, but that book really focuses on how white supremacy is baked into um, uh, American Christianity. Um, and it reminded me as I'm reading one of uh, Dr. Eddie Glaudi's works at the same time, mm. uh, the way yeah. that he says, you know, white supremacy is not a distortion of the American idea. Uh, it is in fact baked into, embedded in the American idea. Um, and uh, it means that when we're, you know, basically in order to uh, eradicate white supremacy, it's going to mean 
fundamental changes in terms of white Christianity and fundamental changes in the way we go about democracy. Um, last thing I want to say about that is, and for anybody who's uh, from the North and I'm from the Chicago area, um, uh, your book is really clear. This is not about simply uh, uh, white evangelicals in the South. Uh, that there are very similar uh, racist attitudes, uh, very much still in the white Christian mainline uh, uh, Protestantism, which I'm United Methodist, so that my denomination is squarely in the middle of that, uh, and also within white Catholicism. Uh, so it is, again, it's, a, it's one of those books that um, um, I recommend. Uh, uh, not least of which is with all of the controversies we have going on today uh, in so many cities in the United States about uh, um, uh, how we um, have memorialized um, the Confederacy in terms of monuments and, and stained glass and panels and the like. Um, uh, your, your, the chapter in your book on that would itself be worth the read, the chapter on markers as far as I'm concerned. So really appreciate all that you've done there. No, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So it get, comes down to the question, uh, which is the question of this course. Uh, um, so given, given that, given, given that white supremacy has been baked into the way that we practice Christianity in the U.S., regardless of what we think Christianity in its ideal is and the way we practiced it, it's there. Um, and it's been baked into our democracy. Um, it also seems like this is a real um, crossroads is even strong enough. It's a it's a it's it's a matter of urgency. It's a matter of I mean I feel like democracy is sort of slipping into the mouth of hell uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, the U.S. right now. And I'd like to be you know amongst those people of faith who um, helps pull it out um, and strengthens it, not so that it's simply you know, uh, let's return to the normalcy of the 1950s, um, but a democracy that can actually handle the kind of, um, and, and uh, the kind of multicultural democracy, uh, which, you know, some folks like in the, in the book, uh, you know, How Democracies Die have said, that hasn't been anywhere in the world. Uh, this is still could be the hope of the world, um, mm -hmm. but we've not done it yet. So, uh, I'd really like, uh, love to hear some of your thoughts and how could people of faith actually help contribute to regenerating democracy in the U.S.? Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Professor Ed Glaude's uh, book. I, I, I wish I had had that book uh, with me when I was writing. It wasn't out yeah. yet, um, you know, but um, it's funny. Um, Eddie and I have been traveling, I think, similar paths. We're both from Mississippi. Uh, we're mm -hmm. both about the same age, um, you know, and we both kind of have come up through the kind of AAR, American Academy of Religion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, ranks and have kind of been in, in informal conversation, um, but weren't really in direct conversation. So it, it's interesting to me to see the sort of indictment, I think you're right, of how it's been baked into American, white supremacy has been baked into American democracy. Um, and then I think, you know, my book is really focused on essentially a similar thing, but I think what's been even more overlooked, and that is how it's been baked into American Christianity, right? I, I think yep. you, what you already hinted at um, is that we have this tendency, we, and I, you know, so I, I, I'm saying we as a white, yeah. someone who identifies as white yeah. and Christian myself, um, we have this tendency to protect um, a kind of abstract version of Christianity, right. you know, right. um, over against any criticism of real Christians and what they do in the world, right, right. you know, um, and, and I, I think that's, to me, I'm, I'm really wanting to kind of shatter that distinction and to say, look, we have to deal with the lived Christianity that we've inherited, not some ideal that we protect every time we don't like something that, you know, that's done. And so, you know, for example, um, you know, I write about Dylan Roof in the book, um, mm -hmm. you know, who was a member in good standing at at a Lutheran church, an yeah. ELCA, ELCA. Lutheran, which is a, yep. a mainline Protestant denomination. It wasn't yep. some backwards, off, you know, uh, backwoods, evangelical, you know, um, rural uh, right. uh, kind of thing. And, and there he very comfortably, um, you know, held his, um, his, his white supremacy wasn't divorced from his Lutheran faith or, or right. even, even in his own head, he, was, he wasn't segmenting those things. Right. I mean, he had blended them very comfortably 
together. And right. I, I included a sketch in the book of, um, I was stunned to, when I, I kind of looked through um, his a journal that he had written in prison um, that got admitted as evidence in his trial, in his murder trial. Um, and in that journal, uh, the news didn't really report on it that much. But no, um, I don't remember seeing that it, at all. You yep. start seeing every other page he sketched across, um, even his personal, like he, he developed a little personal logo, a kind of white supremacist logo, but anchoring that logo is a cross, right? Yep. And each quadrant yep. of the cross that, that the cross makes are white supremacist symbols. But the thing anchoring the whole thing is a cross. And the, the two of the biggest portrait uh, little sketches in his journal are a full page um, uh, sketch of a cross and a full page of a white Jesus emerging from the tomb with a kind of halo, um, you know, around his head. So, and, and, and that sketch actually showed also quite a bit of literacy, even with mm -hmm. Christian iconography. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a rudimentary mm -hmm. right. drawing. It drew very much on um, a kind of history of Christian art. Um, it, yeah. You know, you, it would be recognizable to anyone looking right. at that. Right. Um, and, and I think we have to take that seriously, right? And I yes. think what we too often do is dismiss it and say, oh, you know, that's one misguided young man, you know, um, maybe he's even mentally ill, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really impact um, uh, uh, the, uh, the religion itself. And I, I think that right. protection of saying, oh, well, it's the culture, it's not really the religion, right. Right. is something I think we've got to stop doing. Um, and, and to realize that, no, no, inside of Christian theology, liturgy, practice, we have inherited a faith that had an a priori assumption of white supremacy built into right. it, right? right. And, and it's really our responsibility then, I think, um, to, uh, as, and particularly for, for you know, white Christians, it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to take that seriously. And one of the things we can do with this moment of reckoning that we're in um, is to really start, um, I think, honestly, just telling the truth, really, about our own history, right. um, as difficult as that may be. But I think that's at least a starting point of being willing to tell the truth and then to ask ourselves, okay, if that's the truth, what then do we really need to interrogate in our own faith in order to not continue to passively and, and perhaps even ignorantly pass down these white supremacist assumptions that are often invisible uh, mm -hmm. uh, to those of us who are brought up inside of that context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking that, it, that uh, congregations actually ought to become places that teach uh, or I should say reteach both American history and their own religious history um, because of how much has been left out. Uh, or again, to use one of the phrases that Dr. Cloud uses, uh, disremembered um, yeah. uh, from our history. Yeah, so that was so definitely in terms of dealing with our own story, I mean, knowing, coming to know our own stories, uh, coming to know them with some honesty and then owning that, you know, uh, Christians have done this, not just, uh, and like you said, it's not, you know, every, sometimes in the faith communities, you have a tendency to, you know, everything that's good, that's our real stuff. Mm -hmm. um, everything we do is bad. That's actually some, you know, that's, that's not us. That's, that's, you know, some kind of distortion rather than no, that's actually um, uh, what Christians do uh, becomes what Christianity is. Yeah. Um, and I think you, your, your book makes a really strong point on that so all right that would be one that would and that's a huge one that's not there's nothing small in that task that would be one way uh can you think of anything else that where um people of faith including uh, not only christians but uh thinking of other the other faith traditions in the united states uh and their spiritualities their stories their myths um and all uh, all of which is important to um, uh, creating a sense of peopleness um, that I think any nation needs in order to be a nation. Um, I mean, it seems like, not seems like it is, that it's, it, it's been white Christian stories that have dominated our understanding of manifest destiny and American exceptionalism and, and you know, what the city set on a hill is, mm -hmm. even though I'm going to in the blog soon, I'm going to be pointing out, City Set on a Hill is actually a statement of judgment uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as it's written. It's the, we're a city set on a hill and everybody's looking at us. And if we fail here, we're going to be judged more harshly than anybody mm -hmm. else. You know, um, Rather than we're a city set on a hill, look at, look at the great privilege we've been given uh, sort of thing. So 
I'm looking, I'm looking for, you know, ways and again, ways in which people of faith can help regenerate democracy. Yeah. Uh, not only, and you know, some of it's around, you know, uh, voter and uh, um, uh, uh, calling out when voter suppression is happening and that sort of thing. But it seems like there's a spirit of democracy also um, uh, that is, uh, every democracy has a spirit. It's a matter of which spirit it is at this point. And I'd like for the more of the better angels of our religious natures to, you know, uh, be contributed to that uh, that new democracy that needs to be made. Yeah, well, you know, I, I appreciate this this kind of point toward the pragmatic here, you know, and and I because I, I think you do have to find where does the rubber meet the road, where are the levers that we can pull, you know, to really make a difference. Right. I, I think that's right. It can't stay kind of all up here, you know, um, in our heads. It's got to get on the ground. Um, you know, in some ways. And, you know, I, um, I point to a couple of things in the, in the book, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of run through a couple. Um, and, you know, I will say, I don't think there's any five-point plan, you know, here. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think, but I do mm -hmm. think people have got to right. look around them, right, and look for opportunities right. Um, right. in a more organic, uh, in a more organic way. Um, uh, so I, I certainly resisted the temptation to have the last chapter of the book be, and here's the 10-step program, <laughs> you know, right. to sort right. of, you know, sort this out. Um, but but I do think it, it's about um, you've hinted at some of it a, a kind of re-narration you know of our story um, and and I, I think even of interrogating um, how do we envision when we use words like the American people our um, you know these right. kind of collective nouns right. like what do we have in mind you know when we're when we're doing right. that who do we have in who's in who's out um, I think that's really important um, you know way to kind of think about. Um, things. And then I, I think also, this would be like really, really pragmatic. Um, you know, uh, in the church setting, um, ev every church website has um, about us, our history, mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. page on their, their website. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would happen if every church really tried to tell a more honest story uh, mm -hmm. there? Those are always mm -hmm. kind of rosy accounts of, mm -hmm. you know, the, found, the kind of four founding families or whatever, you know, that kind of bound together and it's all great mm -hmm. and good. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, what if, what, what if, what if churches that are sitting in the suburbs, white, you know, particularly white churches sitting in the suburbs, uh, told a more honest story about their participation in the white flight out of the city core, um, you know, and, uh, when they transplanted, there's plenty of churches that used to be downtown and transplanted themselves out to the suburbs, right, right? When whites were leaving, um, downtown and abandoning the public schools after Brown v. Board of Education, um, you know. Or if they've got um, a, a uh, you know a private academy that's attached to the church that was started in the 1960s or the 1970s, it's pretty clear what most of those were set up to do. Again, is to kind of be a place where white students could go, so they didn't have to right. mix with right. um, African American students in the public school. So I mean, I think there's lots of ways. If churches would just say, "Why are we where we are? Mm -hmm. um, how do we get here? Mm -hmm. um, and um, why are we here rather than somebody somewhere else?" I mean. That even just that kind of pulls yep. the lid off yep. of it, I think, yep. um, a lot. And then personally, I mean, one of the things I did uh, for the book, I mean, just this is just like an individual thing um, that I was kind of surprised um, yielded as much as it did. Is I just spent a couple of weeks. It really wasn't even that long. Um, we're trying to spend like an hour a day um, journaling a bit, and and I asked myself, okay, so I'm I'm white. I grew up in this kind of um, uh, fairly kind of white homogeneous bubble setting in the South and the evangelical churches. Um, where does race, if I think back about my childhood and early adulthood, wh where does race show up even in my memories? Right. Like wh where, can, where am I even aware of it? Because you know, one of the luxuries right. we have if we're white is that it can remain kind of invisible um, to right. us. And so trying right. to pay attention, where does it show up? Where do I remember it? And that was actually quite helpful for me in mm -hmm. just kind of raising some awareness of, um, things that I think, you know, once they kind of come to light should be so obvious, but I think often are really um, repressed and suppressed. And then kind of sitting with those things for a while yeah. and thinking yeah. about what role they played and kind of forming, uh, you know, forming us, uh, you know, as, in, as into, into who we are and what wrong turns they may have led us, right. you know, or right. blind alleys that may have led us down. Right, right. I, as, as you talk to black people and white people and ask the question of white people, you know, when did you first realize you were white? Might take a lot of effort. Whereas for black people, yet when did you first realize you were black? Um, there's there tends to be clearer, clearer yeah. understandings of that. Yeah. So that's that, that's a tremendous question. 
yeah, uh, the last point I guess I'd, I'd, I'd want to underline, and this does come from your book, um, uh, the last chapter is on reckoning. Uh, and uh, yes, the, um, I'm a, um, uh, I, was, I cut my teeth on, uh, on the ecumenical movement. Mm. Um, and so much of the ecumenical movement was around reconciliation. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of the language around, uh, uh, around um, uh, civil rights was around reconciliation, uh, uh, integration and the like. Uh, and uh, uh, I've, I've been converted over time that um, reconciliation uh, needs some steps. There need to be some steps in between there's confession and then there's reconciliation. Um, and I think from our religious traditions, maybe the retrieval of penance uh, uh, and the goal mm -hmm. going along mm -hmm. with the words of reparation, repair and the like um, might be really helpful that forgiveness is, you know, um, forgiveness may be somewhat further down the road, reconciliation per se, or conciliation may be further down the road. And between confession and getting there, um, uh, what, are the, what are the ways in which we as people of faith could say, you know, from our tradition, um, here's, what, here's what penance means. Here's what meaningful uh, penance means. Not the beating yourself on the back part of it, but the trying to make amends. Mm -hmm. trying to make amends. So that may be another uh, kind of avenue for a pragmatic outcome um, uh, in terms of how we really reckon here. Yeah, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. The, it, it was certainly an insight for me too that I came to sort of working uh, with some congregations and studying some congregations that I think we're trying to walk this road. Um, so there's two mm -hmm. that I talk about in the book um, that are actually, um, my, my extended family's from Macon, Georgia. Yep. So I kind of went back there and, um, there's two churches, one predominantly white, one predominantly black that are actually both called first Baptist church in Macon. Yep, right, right. Um, and the, they, the reason for that is because they used to be the same church in the 1820s. Um, they were right, founded right. by whites who owned slaves. Um, and then, uh, the enslaved part of the church was actually given its own church, um, as tensions were heating up around the civil war and abolitionists. Uh, movements and then finally gained their own independence after the Civil War, but then sat in this, you know, modestly sized town right across around the corner from each other and ignored each other for 150 years, kind of yeah. lived their own lives. And then finally, um, you know, about seven years ago, had two pastors um, who um, man just got together and said, like, okay, what are we doing here? We, we share this history. We share this, you know, this kind of block. Um, and mm -hmm. yet we have no connection mm -hmm. whatsoever. And they've spent mm -hmm. the last five years in a, in a really a covenanted um, relationship and uh, mm -hmm. pledging to try to walk this very difficult road and uncomfortable and awkward road together mm -hmm. uh, to try to have a more honest conversation about the past and, and how they might be in more community in the future. And I think the, the big question there that um, uh, particularly the pastor of the white church, Scott Dickinson, um, you know, came to is, is, um, is really saying, yeah, we, we, he actually said to me, like, we've stopped talking about reconciliation for in yeah. our church, yeah. right? right. Um, because it, it feels like an overreach or it's trying to end a conversation too soon, uh, right? right? Bec right. And, and that right. what it hasn't really done is fully reckoned with the questions of justice and repair. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, one of the things I've been as they're saying is like that, that formula, I think has been so seductive to white Christians mm -hmm. in particular, right? Mm -hmm. It's let's mm -hmm. apologize, let's lament, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll get forgiveness, and mm -hmm. then we'll put our arms around each other and sing yes. Kumbaya, yep. and we'll be reconciled, right? right? right. And, but yeah, the whole question of, of uh, justice and repair, which is the costly part of that conversation, right, right. just gets completely right. skipped over um, in that. And, and one quick example, um, this story, because I, I, I think it puts such a fine point on it from the Southern Baptist Convention, which is my home denomination that I grew up in. You know, when they apologized for slavery in 1995, this was 150 years after the formation of the of the uh, denomination, they had a formal resolution at the convention, apologized for slavery, um, and they orchestrated this little bit of, um, I call it kind of, you know, theological theater, where they apologized, they voted, um, and then they immediately had an African-American minister come to the stage and accept the apology on uh, behalf of all right. African-Americans, you know, and, and, and everyone erupts in applause and we're done, right, um, right. was the sense of right. things, like 150 right. years or more and more, of oppression undone in 15 minutes of, you know, theological theater um, isn't really, I think, what 
the the Bible has in mind when it talks about repentance, um, you right. know, and so I think recovering, I, I love that pen, the penance idea, right, of kind of recovering something meaningful um, there. What does that mean, um, you know, for us, for us to do? And I think that there's a lot of conceptual, hopefully creative, um, you know, work to be done in that space. Yep, there is. Robert P. Jones, thanks so much for being with me. Um, I'm positive you're going to be really busy between now and <laughs> November 3rd because, you know, every single day it seems like there is some new and wacky um, uh, uh, public theological statement or comment coming from someone in the administration or uh, trying to support the administration. And you, you, you're not wanting for lack of material right now, I'm sure. Right. No, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate appreciate what you're doing. Um, uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, thanks. I'm glad to be here with you. Good. All right. Thanks. Take, you take care. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Bye.